Y'all turn to Genesis chapter 3. While y'all turn in there, I mind anybody watching and want CDs, DVDs, anything like that, just let me know. We'll be glad to send it to you. Or you want some of the uh, tracks that uh, uh, Heidi made up, we'll send those to you. Um, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the fig tree so I can uh, fix some things I've had wrong in the past. Um, we'll hopefully got a little better understanding. I'm going to try and correct a few things. So go to Genesis chapter 3. Now remember, anytime you want to study a subject, first go the first time it appears in Scripture, find it, and you'll get a good idea of what it's going to be all about. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now that's not what God said. He's twisting the word a little bit, but he's also planning in her mind the idea that God was trying to keep something from them that they uh, that would be good for them rather than the, the opposite being true. But it says, The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Notice when she quotes, she removes the word freely. And she adds something about works, touching with her hands. So right off the bat, we see that the change is going to be putting works in the place of grace. And that's what's going on all the way through the Bible. Verse 4, The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened. Now, were they physically blind before? No. No. Then their eyes become open to something they had not noticed before. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So... Adam and Eve, the very first thing they do in when they see that they're lacking something, and they're lacking that covering, and by the way, all the way through Scripture, what does the covering represent? Righteousness. Righteousness. So what do they recognize about themselves? But they ain't got no righteousness. They ain't got no righteousness. Now when a man recognizes that about himself, his first instinct is to do what? Works. Go to work to get righteous. Yeah, That's right. the very meaning of the word religion. Okay, and this is what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> religion means the act of binding back again. It's not so much that religion binds the person, but although it does, but the idea behind the meaning of the word is I recognize that I am separated from the God that I worship by something, and I need to do something to put myself back in right standing with Him. In other words, my religion, they say, is going to be the means whereby I'm put back in right standing with God. I'm going to bind myself back to God. Now, why did Adam and Eve sew fig leaves together? Because they were ashamed. Because they were ashamed. They realized they had done something and they tried to cover it to be back in right standing with God, didn't they? Okay? Now, that's the, that's the very meaning of the word. Upon recognizing their lack of covering, and that's righteousness, men always by nature immediately try to act in an effort to cover themselves. Y'all know that's our nature. You do something wrong before you ever think what's your first instinct. How do I hide this? And we'll cover this up, right? Sweep it under the rug. Now, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Before we get into the fig tree, I just want to read these verses. Second Timothy 3 1. He says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers. By the way, what's perilous mean? Yeah. Rough danger, right? Perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Notice this peril. Folks, we're not talking about physical peril, we're talking about spiritual peril. Watch. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. As opposed to lovers of who? The Lord. God. They don't love the Lord. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, if that don't sound like the United States today, I, I wouldn't... I, I guess that's us, isn't it? Yes, sir. How about the lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God? What are we told every day on the TV and the radio? 
If it feels good, do it. It's okay, right? Yeah. Hey, Dean. So then when he's talking about these things, again, he's not talking about physical killing and all. He's talking about an attitude, isn't he? He's talking about a, a mode of thinking. So he says in verse 5, now watch this group. Having a form of godliness. You know, we're in 2 Timothy uh, 3, 6. Having a form of godliness. Now what does the form mean? A likeness. A likeness. An outward appearance, right? Is a form physical. Think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah, see yeah, it, yeah, right? Sleep form, yeah. So they have a form of godliness. Then what are these people going to be acting like? Godly. Like they're godly. Think about it. We're not talking about the, the prison system here, folks. We're not talking about the bar rooms. And the, so what are we talking about? <coughs> religion. He says they have a form of godliness. Remember what religion is. It's an act. It's an outward action to cover up something you're lacking. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So then, will these people from a distance look godly? Mm -hmm. yep. And the closer you get, you know, I, I used to be into um, cars, old cars. We'd go all over the country, car shows. And there would be some cars you would see from a distance and you'd think, man, that thing's fine. And as you got up closer, you, all these problems oh, wow. would jump out, right? But there were some that you saw from a distance and you didn't appreciate them. But when you started getting up closer, you couldn't believe the work that they put into them, all right? So then if I look in the distance and I see something, it might look good, right? But when I get up and start inspecting it, I find out there's something else. Now watch here. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So are they denying the power of godliness? Hold your hand here and go to Romans 1. Is Chris feeling any better? The crud? Yes. All right, Romans 1 16, Paul says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written and on and on. Now back to Timothy. If the person has the form of godliness but they deny the power, power of what? Godliness. What did we just read the power of God is found in? The gospel of Christ. So if I just come up here and I write the gospel of Christ. What would it mean today to have a form of godliness but deny the power? Preach another gospel. How about do people that preach all these false gospels look godly? He, Chris was just telling us about one. He saw the, uh, the seed guy. Uh, what's his name? Murdoch. Murdoch. Said, Boy, does he look godly on a show? Mm -hmm. And he holds the Bible. He never opens it, but he holds it. Mm -hmm. And he talks, sin this and sin that. He don't come on there with, and, and look right in the TV and say, all right, I'm fixing to screw y'all over good. He don't say that. He hides it. Yeah, he does. So in other words, that man is given the pretense that he's doing something in the name of God, but is he preaching the gospel of Christ? No. Then from a distance in his nice suit and all, he looks pretty godly, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. But when you get up and start inspecting him, what do you find out? He ain't godly. Yeah. Now, how do you inspect him? By his word. You inspect him by the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now keep holding Timothy and go over to Matthew. Uh, I think it's 12. Yeah. Matthew 12, 33. Alright, Matthew 12, 33. Jesus says, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, who can, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So then, if a man opens his mouth, you're going to find out what's on the inside, won't you? Mm -hmm. Now, he says, verse 35. A good man... Out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. Now, how in the world could there be a good man when Romans 3 says there's none good? 
No, not one. It's a justified man. What did the new covenant promise was going to be put in a man? A new heart, right? A spirit. So then the only way a person can begin to have good things come out of them, what are they going to have to be? They're going to have to be saved where they can talk about the truth of Jesus Christ. So he says, a good man has a good treasure of the heart. By the way, the treasure, what did Paul say the saved man has in his vessel? A treasure, okay? He says, out of the heart bring forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. By the way, think about what the evil is. The good and the evil over there. Was Eve wanting to run around getting drunk and killing? She wanted to be like God. What is the evil thing in the scripture? It's iniquity, folks. It's self-righteousness. It's wanting to be like God. And then he says, uh, verse 36, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now this is fascinating to me. Did Jesus Christ say we're saved by grace through Paul? No, I don't mean through Paul. Through Paul did he say we're saved by grace, not of works. But then did he say we're created unto good works, right? What's the good works that we're created unto? To, tell to, tell, to spread the gospel, right? Well, what would be, if that's good work, what do you call a guy that don't work? Yeah. A slacker. A slacker. <laughs> How about, is he idle? Yeah. Idle words. See the difference? Mm -hmm. If you speak these words, will they do the work of God? Yeah. yeah. But what if you speak another gospel? No that ain't produce uh -huh. nothing. That's idle. That's evil. That produces thorns and thistles. This produces fruit. Okay? Even if people don't believe it, does the gospel produce fruit? Yeah. It does. Now he says, verse 36. I say unto you, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then it's all about words. It? Can you look at a person and tell if they're saved? No. No. So if I saw you at a distance, if I, if I had been looking out the window and I saw Dina coming, could I say, hey, she's saved? No. no. What if Dina had on a full-length dome skirt, had her hair up in a bun this high, no makeup, no jewelry, right? And she come up just as, as y'all ever see those old pictures from the 1800s, how those couples look? Y'all yeah. ever see them smiling? Mm -hmm. I like looking at those. Those poor ladies, they had a hard life, didn't oh, they? Yeah, yeah. These ladies you see today in that type of garb, do you see them smiling and laughing and cutting? No, you're very right. As she's coming, I'd say, well, that's a godly woman. And she gets up on me and I think, wow, this is a godly woman. And I'd say, ma'am, you, you really live in godly, aren't you? And she'd begin to tell me about everything but Jesus Christ. Would that woman have the form of some kind of godliness? Yes, yes. But yeah. did she actually have the fruit? No. no. Yeah. Dina could have come walking up here in a string bikini and I'd have said, oh no, look what's coming. And then <laughs> Dina got up here and opened her mouth and said, Jesus Christ died for my sins. <laughs> right. So it's not the form that we're looking for. It's what's coming out of the mouth. All right. Now, back to 2 Timothy. All right, back to 2 Timothy, verse 5 again. He says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Can anybody think of another way Paul said this? He said, If a man preach any other gospel, let, it let him be a curse. Get away from him. Verse 6, For of this sort are they which <coughs> creep into houses, and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Now, does this mean only women are fooled here? No. no. Think about the context. Who got fooled back there in the garden? Mm -hmm. Y'all see the picture? Mm -hmm. How did Eve get fooled? Be like God's. Mm -hmm. like, like a higher creature. Now, he says, verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So this bunch is not, look, he's not talking about learning English and history. He's talking about the Word of God. Verse 8. Now, as Janus and Jambres. Now, as means in the same manner. As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. How did Janus and Jambres withstand Moses? They duplicated. They duplicated. They did some magic tricks. 
Now, folks, it, there's nothing in that story that tells me that they had mirrors and smoke. They really had a power to do something, didn't they? To a certain point. What's going on in the world today? Amen. Folks, that same charismatic stuff is getting everywhere. It's every... I mean, little old country churches that have never fooled with this stuff. It's getting in there, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's like what's binding all the tares together. Well, I find people in the last days, perilous times, Paul said... Are they going to be doing exactly what Janice and Jambres did? Now, what in the world would make you think if you saw a sign, I don't care if it's real, would you believe it? It's not from God. Nope. Folks, we walk by faith, not by sight. All right, so then, these people are going to be not preaching the gospel of Christ, and they're going to be preaching another gospel. Now, how did Jesus Christ prove His gospel before it was written down? Miracles. With signs and wonders. Do you actually have that prosperity, health, and wealth gospel anywhere in that scripture? Then how are men proving it today? With so-called signs and wonders. Folks, Satan ain't never had an original idea in his life. He saw what Jesus Christ did back here. He's imitating it today. A guy said, well, I gave that guy a check for a thousand and I got this back. And I said, well, what make you think those two are related, right? Well, I saw it. I, well, you might have saw it. Folks, if somebody come in the door right now and could... Give me a head full of hair. Hallelujah. But it ain't got nothing to do with God. No. It, no matter how real the thing is, it is not of the Lord. Why? Because we walk by faith. And faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Okay. Now back to this fig tree. Go back to Judges 9. Judges 9? Yeah, Judges 9. Judges 9, 6. Six, we got a parable here. The men of Israel are, are trying to pick a king to rule over, right? <coughs> Who was supposed to uh, give them a king when the time came? The Lord. The Lord. Okay, so these men are going to pick their own leader here, right? Mm -hmm. It says, verse 6, All the men of Shechem gathered together, and all the house of Milo, and went, and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of the Mount Gerizim. He lifted up his voice and he cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, you men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. Now here comes the parable. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign now over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, whereby, uh, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? So the first tree back here we've got is the olive tree. And the olive tree is associated with fatness. Okay. Next he says, verse 10, The tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? <coughs> now notice the two words in there. Y'all see those two pronouns? Sweetness. How about my? Mm -hmm. My sweetness and my fruit. What's religion all, all about? Mm -hmm. My fruit. My, my works, right? Now he says, verse uh, 12. Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. The vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, wherewith cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? So the vine here has to do with my wine. Now who could they turn to next? Then said all the trees unto the bramble. Notice it's all the trees. Come thou and reign over us. The bramble said unto them, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. If not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So after the first three comes the bramble. What is bramble? Spike, like thorns. Yeah, thorns. All right, if you plant a vineyard, if you plant an olive tree, a fig tree, or a vine, does it produce something? Yeah. yeah. Does bramble produce anything? No. 
first off, these these four things are gonna they they can they match up with the times back here. I find out back here that God makes a covenant with Abraham, doesn't he? And through this covenant is Abraham and the, his children going to be the source of God's blessings. That's the olive tree. Okay. Then I find out 490 years later, God calls Israel out and we get a new tree with Moses. Okay. We get the covenant under Moses. And that's the fig tree. Now what was that covenant under Moses all about? It's supposed to show them their rotten nature, their unrighteousness. And what did they do with it? They made a religion out of it. That's the fig tree. Notice the fig tree is the religion. Then we come to the next one. 490 years later, God picks another man, doesn't He? David. He makes a covenant with David. This covenant's about a throne going in all the world, isn't it? We've got the vine. And then 490 years later, I find out that they lose this situation. And who comes in and takes over the whole, whole nine yards? Babylon. Okay? Or the Gentiles. From that time forward, who's been ruling that land? How long will that go on? Until the second coming. You got it. Okay? So these trees not only match this, and remember the bramble, that's when they it turned over to them, but it also matches some covenants. Now quickly, look at the fig tree. Let, let's take a look at some things about it. Let's prove when the fig tree started. Alright, Hosea 9. all about the house of Israel's being uh, divorced, cast away. But look what he says about him in verse 10. Hosea 9, 10, he says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers at the first, as the first ripe in the fig tree. Then when was the first ripe in the fig tree? In the wilderness. Watch what he says. At her first time. Then did the fig tree go way back or did it start back here with Moses in the wilderness? Starts here, doesn't it? It says, but they went to Baal Peor. Remember in Numbers when they're under Balaam and they joined unto Baal? And they separated themselves under that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. When did God make this covenant right here, this fig covenant? When did he make this with Israel? What do we call this covenant? The law. Of Moses. Well, how long did the law of Moses last? Until the cross. Okay. Now, previously, I had been studying and had had this thing about the fig tree screwed up on this side of the cross. So I'm gonna try and fix it today. I hope. All right. Now, we had this covenant they entered into, and Moses read it to them several times, and he said, "He, how much of it did they have to keep?" Oh, All of it. And what did Israel say every time? We can do it. We can do it. What does that, that speak of? Arrogance. Arrogance and self-righteousness. Folks, that's religion. That's the fig tree. Now, these trees are amazing. Does the olive tree in Scripture ever get cut down? No. In Romans 11, it gets pruned, doesn't it? Y'all remember that? The olive tree never gets cut down, does it? It gets some branches cut off and some new branches graft in, right? And what does the olive tree have to do? The promises made to Abraham. Have you and I been made partakers of the promises of Abraham? Yeah. yeah. How about the vine? Does the vine ever get cut down? No, nope. it gets pruned. The vine gets pruned too, doesn't it? Remember Jesus said in uh, John 15, I'm the true vine. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, I cut it off, right? Mm -hmm. So the other branches can bear fruit. So the olive tree never gets cut down. The vine never gets cut down. But guess what happens to the bramble in Scripture? It's burned up in the fire. 
What happens to the fig tree? It's cut. It's cut down, roots and all. It withers up and it dies, we're going to see. Okay? So then what does that tell us about what the fig tree represented? It comes to an end, doesn't it? It has a stopping point. The others don't. Okay? So let's, let's go on with this. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Go to Joel chapter 1 real quick while we're here. Next book. Watch what happens to his fig tree. Alright, Joel 1, 6. He says, For a nation has come up upon my land. That's Assyria. Strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. He hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. When he come in there, did he take the kingdom, David's throne? He sure did, didn't he? What about did he bark the fig tree? The fig tree doesn't go away. He skin all the bark off of it. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches there are made white. In other words, there ain't no fruit on it, right? So the fig tree then is affected at this point. But go back over there to, uh, to just go to Romans chapter 10. I'm trying my best to follow my notes. So. Romans 10.1 Alright, was Israel still under this covenant when Jesus Christ showed up? They are. Yeah. But technically, was it the house of Israel that was under it, or was it just the house of Judah? Israel. It's just the house of Judah. Because yeah. something happens to the house of Israel, they get divorced, don't they? Yeah. This was a marriage contract, right? <clears throat> Alright, when a marriage contract goes into divorce and the woman's thrown out the house, she's not part of it anymore, is she? Uh -huh. Well, the house of Israel back here is cast out. But who continues in the house? Judah. 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 So who? And, and the remnant of Israel will bring Jesus in. Right? To bring Jesus Christ into the world. That's right. So. The house of Judah takes up the mantle of the of the system, don't they? So they continue on as the fig tree. When Jesus Christ comes, is Judah in Jerusalem under that covenant doing their whole religious thing? They are. What does John the Baptist tell them to do? Repent. Quit trying to get right with God through that. Repent and get baptized. And he tells them, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Right? What was the entire purpose of the law? To show guilt. And what did Israel do with it? They thought they had righteousness. So they're doing, they're calling good evil and evil good, aren't they? Right? Now think about the religious system in the world today. They're doing the same thing. Basically, all religion. Hey, I was uh, got a text from Ram Lafitte this morning. He said this, and I'm like, well, you're right about that. All religion perceives that there is a problem, don't they? Yeah. But they got the wrong problem. What's the entire religious world, if I just come over here and I just write religion over here, what does the entire Christian religion perceive as the problem today? Sin. Sin. So what do they go about trying to do? Sin. Pay for sin. Are they ever going to get to the Lord that way? How are you ever going to heal the disease when you got the wrong diagnosis? You're not going to. Imagine if you went in, you had a... I had an uncle one time. He wasn't even my uncle, my uncle Sam, but he run to the doctor. He was having a heart attack. They run him down there. Some young doctor come in there, and he, man, they're going to give him this and give him that and do all this. And the other guy come in, he looked at him. He said something to him, Sam, what you been eating? And he told him what he's been eating. He said, ain't nothing wrong. He's got gas, yeah. Huh. That young guy was trying to work on his heart, right? Mm -hmm. He tried to kill him, right? Yeah. That old doctor said, go home. You all right? Mm -hmm. He had the wrong diagnosis, didn't he? What's all the religious system trying to do today? Work to pay for their sins. Do they have the diagnosis completely wrong? Yeah. According to religion, the problem is sin. According to God, what's the problem? Unbelief. Unbelief. Uh, according to God, the problem is unbelief. Okay. Now, he says in Romans 10.1, Brethren, 
My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Okay. What about this group over here today? Are they zealous? Yeah. Folks, some of them are so zealous you couldn't believe it. Every time I read this verse, I think about those guys that ride those 10 speeds in three-piece suits in August. Y'all ever mm -hmm. pass them out there? Hey, that's zealous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What's it doing for the Lord? Nothing. Nothing. How come they've got the form of the godliest people on the face of the planet, but what's the problem? They, they ignore the gospel. Okay? <clears throat> so then this religious stuff is zealous, but God ain't impressed with zealousness. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Now, what is the only solution for sin? A righteous Savior. So if Jesus Christ doesn't die on the cross, thereby making His righteousness available, is there any way man can overcome sin? No. no. So then I need to quit trying to attain my own righteousness and have the righteousness of Christ put to my account. The moment that I finally see how guilty I am in God's eyes and how unrighteous I am, can I quit trying to work my way into righteousness and just trust the Lord? Yeah. So he says next verse, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. How was Israel trying to get righteous? Through the law. They were trying to use the law for righteousness, weren't they? What's religion doing today? Same thing, Same thing folks. They're trying to use Moses' law, Christian law, whatever law. They're trying to use works to get righteous with God. The moment a person sees that they can't do that and they have failed, now that person, somebody preached the gospel to them and they'll see it, won't they? Can you preach the gospel to that person before that point? Yeah. If you go to offer a robe to somebody that's already got a robe on, they, they don't need the robe. Well, if I've got my own righteousness, I can't see the righteousness of Christ. And so this fig tree really it epitomizes all of this. Now go over to Luke 5. Does man like religion? Yes. He loves it. Why does religion appeal to man? Because it shows him something. Yeah, that's right. It gives him something to glory in that he can show off and be proud of. Yeah. Luke 5. Luke 5. Yep, Luke 5, 36. Alright. Was the law severe? Yes. You yes. better believe it. Did Israel, when Jesus Christ come, love their religion? Mm -hmm. Then somebody must have adjusted the severity of it. Right? If you had a contract that said, do it all or die, you wouldn't love that contract, would you? Mm -hmm. But what if you could change it to say, make a good effort and God will accept that. What's religion teaching today? Same, Same thing, thing, right? So Israel did that with the law. Did Israel replace <coughs> God's law with their traditions? Mm -hmm. For instance, the law said, honor thy father and thy mother. Now that don't just mean pay them respect. It means when they get to an age where they can't work, who's supposed to take care of them? The kids. Guess what the Pharisees changed the law to say? If you'll make a donation to the temple, though, we'll, that you, you're not held accountable to God for that. that Y'all see that word, Chorazin? Mm -hmm. In other words, yeah, you ought to take care of your parents, but mm -hmm. if you'll give us a donation, right? Okay, so he says, verse 36, He spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh the rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. So in the context, we've got something new and something old, don't we? Now he says, No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottle shall perish. But new wine must be put in new bottles, and both are preserved. So just what's the context in its simplest form? You can't mix the old and new, can you? <laughs> So Jesus Christ comes. Was He coming to add to Moses' law? Or was He coming to completely abolish that and establish something else? Abolish. abolish. What is religion doing with them today? Trying They're trying to mix them together, aren't they? So He says, verse 39, now this is man's nature. No man also, having drunk old wine, straightway, means immediately, desireth new. For He saith, the old is better. 
Y'all think about people in their religion. Do people love their religion? Mm -hmm. You first preach the gospel to someone, do people straightway see it and want to come? No, folks. They love that stuff they've been doing because the stuff they've been doing appeals to their flesh because it gives them something they can glory in, doesn't it? You say to pe people, hey, excuse me, are you saved? And they stick their chest out and smile and they say, oh, I've been a member of the church for this. I'm a choir director. My husband teaches Sunday school. They'll tell you all those things, won't they? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anybody that does that's lost. I'm saying that that's what they're hanging their hat on, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You're going to take that from them easily? No. Uh -uh. They're going to love to hang on to the old, right? Mm -hmm. Why did the Jews absolutely deny Jesus Christ? They wanted they want status quo, him. didn't they? Yeah. They had a religion. They had a system. They were happy with it. Matter of fact, they said, we got one king, Caesar. Yeah. We're fine. Those leaders were absolutely fine being under control of the Roman Empire because of what? Kept they, they kept steady rolling their money, folks. Yeah. Don't rock the boat. We're bringing in a lot of money. Okay. <clears throat> Go over to. Uh, uh, I tell you, we're gonna we're gonna skip some of these. Did God ever ask for Israel's religious sacrifices? Mm -hmm. You go read Leviticus. You know what every one of those sacrifices says? If you bring this, if you bring that, what did God give them the law for? Mm -hmm. Folks, the, the way the law should have, could have worked, okay, is Moses could have started reading it, and one by one the people's looking around like, wait, Moses, hold, hold on a second. He, I got a friend one time, he said something that really made good sense to me. He said, when we read the law of Moses, we ought to have an orchestra playing music that shakes the house and scares us to death, because that's how serious the law was. Yeah. But Israel loved it, didn't they? Mm -hmm. So then the law, you should have read through the law, and the person looked at each other and said, Hold it, Moses. Hell, uncle, there's got to be another way, right? Yeah. Israel never did that, did they? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, with that in mind, God never told them they could get righteous through doing that stuff, but they went on doing it, didn't they? Y'all remember what Isaiah said to Israel about their religion? He said, When you offer a sacrifice... It's like he cut off a dog's head. He said, when you come in here with your incense, it's a stench in my nostrils. He said, I hate it. I hate your feast days. I hate everything about it. Why? It was all done in a, in a fit of self-righteous pride. They thought, look how special we are because of what we do. How many times have you asked somebody about their salvation and they tell you, well, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. They tell you what they are, what they've done, won't mm -hmm. they? Did God ever ask for any of that? No. no, not a lick of it. Okay, now take that and go over to Jeremiah. We're going to look at this from a, an Old Testament parable kind of here. Jeremiah 24. Alright, Jeremiah 24, 1. Now remember Jeremiah is writing, and at this time, there had already, Nebuchadnezzar had come to town and had taken some people captive, taken some of the treasures, but had he destroyed Jerusalem yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is in between. Now it says he, he hits this vision, Jeremiah 24, 1. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters, the smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. So in other words, after the first group is carried away, Jeremiah sees a, a vision, doesn't he? Now look, I can't draw baskets, but we got two baskets of figs. Okay. And they're setting before the temple. Now, what does that imply? They're offerings there before. There's something that it's supposed to be offered to God, right? What was Israel supposed to be? Supposed to be God's children, weren't they? Yeah. Now, he says, verse 2, One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. The other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil figs, very evil. That cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of Chaldeans for their good. 
So I've got one set of figs good, right? Now, why were they the good figs? They had gone into captivity. Now, that sounds backwards, doesn't it? What is if, if Look, here's the, here's the mentality today. Somebody said, hey, we're going to go in. No, man, get your guns. We're going to fight. Right? Now, think about in Israel. Did, did one group accept the punishment of God and go? Yeah. The, God said, this is what I have decreed. This is my punishment. This is my chastisement. You accept it as truth and go, and I'll take care of you. But what did the evil figs do? They're going to resist. Now think about the law of Moses. What was the law of Moses given to do? Condemn them. One group, let it condemn them. They accepted the judgment of God. What did the other group do? They resisted it. Now this is the story all the way through the Bible. The firstborn and the secondborn. It never changes. We, we get into it. How about the Pharisee and the publican? What's the difference between them? One believed the testimony of God about himself. The other denied it. That's the only difference. How about Mary and Martha? Same thing. How about Cain and Abel? Same thing. All the way through the scripture, right? Now watch what he says about these figs. By the way, notice verse 5 said he's sending them into Chaldea for their own good. Was being condemned by the law a good thing? Yes. Folks, if you've never been condemned by the Ten Commandments in your life, it, you, you've got a problem, right? Yeah. Jeremiah 24, 6, Chris. Uh -huh. He says, For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, will bring them again to this land. In order for this bunch to be saved, what had to happen? They had to get lost first. Didn't they have to go into captivity? What are you and I got to see we're under captive to in the flesh? Sin. Folks, we're sinners. You ain't going to change that. As long as you're working to fight against that, you're resisting what the Word of God says about you. Folks, when a man thinks he can do something, he's saying the Word of God's wrong. God lied. God don't know me. He said, no, that's talking about you, not me. So then we've got this group back here. These have to get lost in what's God going to do to them. They're going to save them. Now I got this bunch is evil. Remember what the evil men don't mean they're drinking, smoking, and gambling. This bunch is resisting. And guess what they're going to do? Oh, we'll fight Nebuchadnezzar. We'll win this battle. We'll do it ourselves. This group is never in captivity. They're never lost. So guess what? They're never saved. How are you going to save somebody that don't need saving? He, I don't know if uh, William in Montgomery was laughing one night. He said, told, said Michael Phelps was like a motorboat. Hey, boy, that's a good descriptor. The swimmer guy. Yeah. If I jumped in Mobile Bay and Michael Phelps was in Mobile Bay, does Michael Phelps need my help? No. <laughs> don't need my help. What about if I'm in Mobile Bay and he jumps in Mobile Bay? Well, I need him to help me. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, he don't need any help, right? This group here said, oh, we'll fight Nebuchadnezzar. As a matter of fact, if we can't fight Nebuchadnezzar, we'll make an agreement with the Egyptians and we'll use our political savvy and we'll go down into Egypt. And It's amazing. God said, I don't care where you go, I'll get you. There's several things in the Old Testament that are just great. One of them said, man goes out and gets away from a lion and he runs into a bear. He escapes from the bear, he goes home and he leans on the wall in his house and a snake bites him and kills him. In other words, had God decreed this punishment, yeah. is it going to come to pass? Yeah. Yeah. Think about Moses' law. That's what Moses' law is for. Okay, now, he goes on. He says, verse 6, I will set mine eyes upon them for good. I will bring them again to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Y'all think about the spiritual implications of this. Building a new house. Planting new seed. Y'all see what is the Lord building a house today? Yep. Mm -hmm. He says, verse 7, I will give them an heart to know me. What in the world has that got to do? That's got to do with Abraham's covenant, folks. Did he say he was going to give them a new heart? See, Abraham's covenant was promised before the law ever stepped in, wasn't it? Yeah. What's the actual parentheses up here? It's Moses' law. So in order for God to give them this new heart, what had to be gotten out of the way? The law. Moses' law. Hey, they got, they got a quick claim and they can do it, don't they? Mm -hmm. 
with a remnant did that over here, didn't they? And they got into the house. What about the rest of them? They perished away. So he says, uh, verse uh, 7, I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the God, or the Lord, and they shall be my people. I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, them that dwell in the land of Egypt. I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. I will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Anyway, they're going to escape that. Y'all think about the sword, the famine, and the pestilence. If I come over here, Jesus Christ talks about some uh, uh, things in Matthew and it perfectly matches something John seen over here. John saw four horsemen, didn't he? First one's on a white horse goes forth. The second one brings a sword and war, doesn't he? The third one brings famine. And the fourth one brings pestilence and death. Is there any way Israel was going to escape that? The only way they could escape that was to accept the punishment of God and go where God told them to go. What's the only way man can escape the wrath of God over here? You're going to have to accept what the Word of God says about you and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, aren't you? Okay. Uh, let's see. To show you what this basket's about real quick, go to Deuteronomy 26. Just real, real quick, Deuteronomy 26.1. Deuteronomy 26 1 it shall be when thou art come in under the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance and possessest it and dwellest in it therein thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee thou shalt put it in a basket and shall go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there so this basket has to do with offering of first fruits not just the feast of first fruits, but all first fruits. So who was supposed to get the first and the best? God. Now y'all think about that today. Who ought to get the best and first of our time? God. Who ought to get the first and the best of our efforts? The Lord. Who ought to be first in our lives? Y'all think about we wake up in the morning and we got a thousand things we ought to do. And one of them is study the Word of God. Which one will we put on the top? And which one will we put on the bottom? Y'all know how we are. You say, yeah, I need to study, but I got to do blah, 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 blah. You know, why don't you just show that we trust the Lord? I mean, you, us. Wouldn't it be better for us to show that we trust the Lord and say, well, I'm going to study His Word first and whatever else needs to be done, the Lord will make sure I get it done. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with these crops. It's to say, look, I don't care what you want to apply it to. How about hope? Should my hope be on the things the Lord has promised me first and foremost or should it be on earthly stuff? The God ought to get the best of everything, shouldn't He? Now He says, verse uh, 3, Thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, that I am come unto the country which the Lord uh, swear unto fathers to give us. And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. So when we see this basket, both of them have to do with offerings, don't they? Mm -hmm. Right? The one has to do with the offering God's looking for. Right? The other has to do with an offering God never asked for. Now come over here. What is the thing God would have us to do today? Believe on His Son. What's the world want to do? They want to believe on their works. They want to offer God their works. They want to put a basket in front of God with all their religious effort in it. You know what that basket's worth? Nothing. Paul said it's worth dung. Okay, y'all know what? Wish Ralph was here. Let's see. Tell us what dung is like that. Would be. <laughs> all right now. Um, uh, let's see, we got that. Go to Matthew 3 real quick. Matthew 3, verse 8. It's going to take, it, it'll definitely take another class to get this, but where I want to go with this to show y'all what, what I've had the fig tree screwed up. The fig tree is given this year also, 
And what I did is I always had that starting over here and going over here, but it won't work. It, it absolutely is wrong. I'm telling you, I had it fouled up, and I'm sorry if I taught you that. The, it's on this side of the cross. I'll show you all. But anyway, Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is he telling them to repent? Mm -hmm. What were they currently doing that they needed to quit doing? They, they, they were in their Jews' religion. Mm -hmm. Look, if they were drinking, smoking, and gambling, well, they ought to quit that too. But that ain't the issue. The issue is they were trying to get to God through their works. Mm -hmm. Did they need to change their mind? Yeah. Didn't you have people say, well, you don't believe in repentance? Oh, yes, I do. Yeah. I Thank God I had a day when I repented. No not mean I quit my drinking, smoking, and gambling, though I ought to. What it means is there came a day when I quit trying to get to God through my works, and I said, that's never going to do it. Lord, I can't. I called on the name of the Lord. People get mad about that and say, you don't have to call on the Lord. Folks, if you've never called on the Lord to say, I'm not talking about a formality. He, all right? It's not a formality. I don't have to sit down and look up and call on the Lord to save me. I've got to know I need the Lord to save me. It, Wayne tells me about being uh, years ago, being out in the woods somewhere and say, just telling the Lord, I ain't righteous, I can't do it. He didn't hear the gospel till years later. But had he already seen the difference? Mm -hmm. So then we've got a situation here where Jesus shows uh, up and before he shows up, he sends John the Baptist to him. Now, did John the Baptist come and tell these people to keep this covenant? No. He told them, quit trying to keep it. Admit that you failed. Confess and wash yourself and admit that you failed. Now, why did John not come telling them to do this? Because John's the forerunner of something new, isn't he? John came, the Bible says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, something else is preached. What did it say since John, what's preached? The kingdom of God. What's the only way a man can get in the kingdom of God? He's got to have righteousness. You ever met anybody that worked for righteousness? You ever met anybody that believed plus worked for righteousness? That's a, that's a, that's a fable too. That's one that fools a lot of people today. Folks, you just let the scripture say what it says. And it says Abraham believed God that was counted unto him for righteousness. So then... What did John come telling the people to do? Turn from the Jews' religion. Okay, now he goes on telling them all these things. Look what it says in verse uh, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, is that group going to turn? No. He said unto them, O generation of vipers. Folks, that's children of the snake. Are they children of the devil? Yeah. Physically or spiritually? Because they've been born of a system, a religious system that teaches self-righteousness. They've got a covering that didn't come from God. It came from the devil. So he says, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Then is the wrath to come going to fall on people? Mm -hmm. He said, bring forth therefore fruits, meat or fit for repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham our father. For I say unto you, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. In other words, quit reading your Jewish pedigree to me and admit what you can't do it. What would have been the work or the fruits meet for proving repentance under John's ministry? Confess, baptize. Were the Pharisees willing to do that? No. Why wouldn't they do it? They, give up their stuff. they wasn't about to give up, and they sure wasn't about to get in the water with the riffraff, were they? No. Right? So then they would not do the thing. That, I mean, that's a, it was a humiliating thing here. Now watch verse uh, 10. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Folks, you know what it means the axe is laid to the tree? You, you take that axe, everybody swung an axe, right? You go split firewood. Do you just go walking up? What do you do first? You set your axe on. You measure it, don't you? That's what it means. The axe is laid to the tree. In other words, what John said is it's fixing the fall. Was it about to fall? Yeah. It was. It is about to fall. We're going to read one more verse and take a break. Go over to Matthew 20, 21, I think. Yeah. Matthew 21, 18. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. 
Folks, this is the 11th day of the first month. It's three days before he dies, right? And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing there on but leaves only. Did it have an outward show? Did it have any fruit? It had a form of figs, didn't it? Form of godliness. And he said, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Now we're going to deal with this more later. But did Jesus Christ just curse that fig tree? Mm -hmm. Did it wither away? Mm -hmm. We're going to read where it says even the roots withered. What's that tell you? It ain't coming back. When did he do this? Right before the cross. Is the year over here or is it over here? It's over here. I'll show it to you in the next class. Okay.